We're continuing our series on the five solas. Now, if it is your first time uh, to join us here at Living Word IT Park, you might be wondering, uh, what is this series all about? What is the word sola? What does it mean? So let me just give a brief review. Um, the word sola is the Latin word for alone. It is used to emphasize the foundational doctrines of the Reformation. And since October is Reformation Month, our church here at Living Word IT Park is celebrating what God did and accomplished during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Now, the five solas are five Latin phrases that emphasize the distinctions between the early Reformers and the Roman Catholic Church. And since we live in a country that is predominantly Roman Catholic, I believe uh, this series can really equip us to reach out to them, to share the gospel with them. And so we've covered uh, two solas already, uh, sola scriptura or scripture alone. And it maintains that the Bible is the highest source of authority in the Christian's life. And it is also the final authority in all matters of faith and morals. Now, Roman Catholics affirm the Bible. They believe in the Scriptures. But they do not believe in sola scriptura or Scripture alone. You see, in Roman Catholic theology, um, the Pope... Church tradition and the scriptures have equal authority. And when there is disagreement between what the Pope said and what the scriptures teach, sadly, most Roman Catholics submit to the authority of the Pope. Now, the Protestant reformers insisted that scripture alone has the final and ultimate authority. We also saw sola gratia last Sunday. Brother Kirk preached on that. Sola gratia means grace alone. And it says sinners are saved as an unearned gift of God's grace, not as a result of work so that no one may boast. Again, Roman Catholics affirm the grace of God even in salvation. But they do not affirm sola gratia when they Talk about salvation, it's always God's grace and human effort, okay? You need to earn God's love. You need to merit God's love through your good works. Now, today, we will focus on the third sola, which is sola fide. Now, anyone who is at all familiar with 16th century Western Europe knows that the doctrine of justification, sola fide, played a prominent role in the Protestant Reformation. For Luther, it became the grid which all other facets of his thought passed. So everything related to his understanding of sola fide, or justification by faith alone. Indeed, sola fide is a hallmark of Protestant teaching. And so as Protestants, we really need to know this fundamental doctrine. Now, what does sola fide mean or faith alone? Well, it affirms that justification that is being made right with God, being declared righteous by God, comes only through faith in Jesus. Convinced that this doctrine is derived from the scriptures, the reformers insisted that a person is justified, that is declared righteous by God, by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. Philip Melanchthon, one of the reformers, explains, Therefore, when justification is attributed to faith, it is attributed to the mercy of God. It is taken out of the realm of human efforts, works, and merits. So today, we're going to consider, consider three things uh, in this sermon. First, we're going to see Martin Luther's discovery of sola fide. And we're going to see some clarifications made by the reformers on sola fide. And we're also going to see how sola fide applies to us 
today. So let's begin with Martin Luther's discovery of sola fide. Now, scholars differ on the timing of Luther's discovery of this decisive uh, doctrine, justification by faith alone. And so rather than seeing his theological discovery as a single decisive event, we should view it as a gradual process. Again, Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk, and as a monk, he has been taught that salvation is through the grace of God, but also accompanied by human effort. And as an Augustinian monk, you need to understand that the anxiety that troubled Martin Luther in the monastery arose from his diligent attention to the emphasis in the teaching in the late medieval church. During that time, exhortations focused on obedience to divine precepts, to the law of God. And so any hope for a welcome before God at death and the final day depended on the number and quality of good works thus produced. And so those called the religious, the monks and the nuns, they had the greatest chance of accumulating such good works because their entire existence focused on worship and service. Now seeking peace with God, Martin Luther heeded these directives. Luther tried to appease his conscience by punishing himself for his sins. He engaged in extreme forms of asceticism in an attempt to pay for his sins. It has been said that he plunged into prayer, fasting, and ascetic practices, going without sleep, enduring bone-chilling cold without a blanket. Now, if you live in Germany, or if you've been to Germany, you know it's extremely cold in Germany during winter time. So when winter came, Martin Luther decided to, to sleep on the floor without a blanket. And he thought by doing that, he would somehow be able to make atonement for his sins. He clearly exceeded the order's religious expectations, seeking to commend himself to God. However, none of his efforts gave him the peace that he so longed for. But when Luther read about the righteousness of God in the book of Romans, his troubled heart found rest in Christ alone. Luther eventually found an answer to his quest through his discovery of sola fide in his encounter with Romans 1, 16 to 17. So we need to understand what these two verses mean for us to know why God used this passage to open the eyes of Martin Luther's heart to the truth, to the gospel. Paul says in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel means good news. It is the good news of salvation. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now for us to understand what this passage means, we need to ask the question, what then is the righteousness of God? And in what sense is it revealed in the gospel? Well, first, it is important for us to identify the intended contrast that Paul makes throughout the book of Romans. You see, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God as opposed to man's righteousness. Human righteousness achieved through conformity to the law of God. And so the choice is between personal righteousness and God's righteousness. Now, before Luther's discovery of sola fide or justification by faith alone, he was trusting in his personal righteousness. 
in his pursuit of holiness, in his disciplined life, in his obedience to the law of God. But no matter what he did, he did not achieve or experience the peace that he was longing for. A.T. Robertson says that righteousness of God in the Greek speaks about a God kind of righteousness. We are saved not through personal righteousness, but through this righteousness that God provides. Now, the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel is the gift of righteousness that God gives to sinners who believe in Christ alone for salvation. So here is where we see the greatness of God and the wisdom of God revealed in the gospel. You see, the standard of God is 100% righteousness. Because He is holy and righteous, He demands perfection. But the problem is none of us can achieve that. The Bible tells us in the book of James, if you have stumbled at one point of the law, you have broken the whole law. So just one sin is enough to really make you a sinner. And we also need to remember the sin that we inherited from Adam. Every person born into this world was born with a sinful nature. If you have toddlers at home right now, you don't have to teach them to be selfish, right? You don't have to teach them to lie. Eventually, they will lie. They will manifest their their greed, their selfishness. Why? It's because they have that sinful nature. And so we do not have a righteousness that can cause us to be accepted by God. And here we see the mercy and the grace of God. God took the initiative. He was not obligated at all to save us. We're the guilty ones. But because He is love, it is in His nature to save guilty sinners for His glory. And in order for Him to do that, He needs to provide a righteousness. And this righteousness is a God kind of righteousness. It provides for us what we could never provide for ourselves. On our own merits, we all stand condemned before the Almighty. And so who is there who would dare to say, I am good enough to go to heaven? As someone has said, a clear conscience is the result of a poor memory. The only people who think they are good enough to go to heaven are people who do not know how sinful they really are. You see, righteousness is what we need but do not have. Therefore, God, knowing that we could never be righteous on our own, has provided a righteousness which comes down to us from heaven above. It is not earned or deserved, but it is given to us by God as a free gift. And so how can we receive this gift of righteousness? How is this righteousness received? Let's read verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. What is the word that is repeated twice here? It is the word, the word faith. This this gift of righteousness is received by faith. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. It's simply received by faith. Now, from faith for faith means that right standing with God is by faith from start to finish. We need to understand that the work of salvation is God's work from start to finish. The Bible tells us in the book of Philippians, God is the author and finisher of our what? Of our faith. It is faith that accepts the word of God. It is faith that recognizes and accepts the merit of the person and work of Christ. Martin Luther said, when you have learned this, you will know that you need Christ, who suffered and rose again 
for you so that if you believe in him, you may through this faith become a new man in so far as your sins are forgiven and you are justified by the merits of another, namely of Christ alone. And since this gift is received by faith, we need to understand faith biblically. Let me share with you three elements of saving faith. First is knowledge. You need to know that God is holy. You need to know that we have offended a holy God, and because of that, we deserve to be punished. We deserve to go to hell. So we need to have that knowledge about God, about who God is. Secondly, agreement. You need to agree that you are a sinner, that you have failed God's righteous standard and you do not have a righteousness on your own. And then the last element is trust. You need to trust in Jesus alone as the only one who can save you from the power and penalty of sin. You see, Luther understood that we are justified by faith in God's righteousness, not by works of the law or personal conformity to the law. Now, with respect to justification, that is being declared righteous by God, Michael Horton notes, a person is declared righteous by God the moment he believes in Christ as his Savior. This declaration is made possible through Christ's atoning work on behalf of the believer. And this really is the good news of the gospel. The moment you put your trust in Christ alone, God gives you this righteousness. The righteousness of Christ is imputed upon you. Therefore, positionally, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God sees you as perfectly righteous in His sight. He has clothed you with this robe of righteousness. As Adam's sin was imputed to humanity, Christ's righteousness is imputed, credited to those who believe in Him. Michael Horton described imputation as the way in which God gives this righteousness or justice to the ungodly through faith. And Greg Allison notes that the crucial distinction between Roman Catholics and Protestants was that the latter, the Protestants, saw the exclusive ground of justification as the imputed righteousness of Christ. So this was the one thing all Protestants held in common and the thing that distinguished them from the Roman Catholic Church. You see, when Luther realized that this righteousness is something established by God and given by God as a saving gift, it really transformed his understanding of the gospel. And we know that understanding of the gospel ignited the Protestant Reformation. It is clear that as early as his lectures on the Psalms in 1513-15 to 15, and Romans 5, the book of Romans 1515-1516, 15, 15 to 15, 16, he was beginning to think differently about how the individual sinner finds forgiveness from a righteous God. Only after some years of biblical study under the inspiration of the theology of Augustine did Luther arrive at a more fully formed, distinctive doctrine of justification by faith alone. You see, Augustine's conversion experience occurred in AD 386. While agonizing in the garden of his house over his moral failures, because during that time, Augustine was in a uh, very promiscuous, immoral relationship. He was very aware that he was sinning against God. Now, as he was thinking about his moral failures, he heard a child in a nearby house repeat in a sing-song voice refrain, Tole lege, pick up and read. And so he decided to pick up his Bible. He opened his Bible, and the Lord led him to Romans 13, 13 to 14. 
And when Augustine read that, he found peace and assurance that his final destination was God's heavenly Israel. And the reason why I bring this up is because Roman Catholics say that Augustine belongs to them. He is a canonized saint, right? Uh, I went to uh, USJR in college. Uh, uh, they, they love St. Augustine. Uh, he has a statue there. But when you study the theology of Augustine, his theology shows us that he understood salvation was by grace alone through faith alone. That's why my church history professors would tell us that Augustine belongs to us. He belongs to the Protestants. Why? Because his understanding of salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. Now, Augustine argued that faith is a gift from God and that salvation is based on God's grace, not human merit. Now, you need to understand the Synod of Orange in 529 AD affirmed the Augustinian view, which became the standard view of the church. Now, at the start of the Middle Ages, the church continued to affirm Augustine's view until Thomas Aquinas set down the medieval Catholic notion of justification and its corollaries of grace, human effort, and merit. Now, Roman Catholics view um, Thomas Aquinas as their champion, the champion of the Roman Catholic Church because he, he developed a system that somehow gave the Roman Catholics some quote-unquote theological basis or grounds as to why they believe salvation is not by grace alone, but that people need to earn or merit God's love. And Thomas Aquinas was a very brilliant scholar, and so he really convinced a lot of people. But sadly, his teaching, this system that he developed, opened the door to new doctrines and practices among Roman Catholics, like the purgatory, selling of indulgences, and praying for the dead. Now, during the Reformation, Martin Luther strongly condemned Aquinas' notion of condign merit and congruous, congruent merit. So let's do some Catholic theology first, okay? I want you to stay with me because it's important for you to understand what Martin Luther went against during the Protestant Reformation. Now, what is a condign merit? It is God's reward for a work accomplished by a person who does his will. God has bound himself, according to them, to reward the person for work that is accomplished with the help of the Holy Spirit. This reward is owed because God, according to them, has bound himself to reward those who do his will. Now, congruent merit depends on the kindness and desire of the one giving the merit. It is a reward that is not owed. An example would be if my nine-year-old son cleaned our living room. That would be a miracle if he did that. Um, but let's say he, he, he cleans the living room, and I bring him out for ice cream as a reward. The ice cream is not owed to him, but he merited the reward by his effort. Now, Martin Luther went against the Catholic system of rewards or rewards for works accomplished. He rejected the idea that rewards contribute to a person's salvation. And so now that that is established, we are saved by grace alone through faith alone, we need to make some clarifications on sola fide. See, the reformers' insistence on sola fide would be a controversial matter in the 16th century because it contradicted the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church concerning justification. Again, Roman Catholics believe that a person is not justified by faith alone, but by faith and, and works. Now, James Payton notes from the perspective of those deep in the medieval church's instruction, the reformers' radical reduction of what was needed for justification was shocking. 
And you need to understand, many people during this time, they grew up thinking and believing that you need to work for your salvation. And so when the Protestant reformers declared, no, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, it was seen as shocking and radical. In an attempt to defend their view on justification, Catholic defenders accused the reformers of being antinomian. That is, they don't care about personal holiness. James Payton states the defenders of the Roman church quickly pointed out that the reformers' teaching would lead to indifference toward godliness. Urging that it came by faith alone seemed to undercut any call to holiness of life. So the reformers responded. For John Calvin and the other Protestant reformers, they declare that and taught that we are justified by faith, but faith is never alone. In other words, yes, we are saved by grace alone, okay? We are not saved by our good works, but we are saved for good works. Do you see the difference? True saving faith, if a person is a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that person's life will experience a major transformation. That person will pursue holiness and obedience not to be accepted by God. He pursues holiness because he has already been accepted and loved by God. There's a big difference. John Calvin, for example, argued that justification by faith necessitates sanctification in life. For the scripture teaches that Christ has been made for us not only righteousness, but also sanctification. Hence, we cannot receive through faith His righteousness without embracing at the same time that sanctification. And so for people who claim to be Christians, who claim to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, but are still living a very promiscuous life, immoral lifestyle, their salvation needs to be questioned. The legitimacy or the authenticity of their salvation needs to be questioned because when God saves a person, He grants the gift of faith, but He also grants the gift of repentance. That person who truly sees the holiness of God and his own sinfulness will mourn over his sin and would cling to Christ for salvation and would depend on the grace of God and the Holy Spirit for his personal transformation. That is why Martin Luther declared, we do not therefore reject good works. On the contrary, we cherish and teach them as much as possible. The works themselves do not justify him before God, but he does the works out of what? Spontaneous love in obedience to God. Luther's statement is in complete harmony with what Jesus said in John 14, 15. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will what? You will keep or you will obey my commandments. Now, before our conversion, before we were justified by faith alone, it was not natural for us to love God. We don't wake up. Loving God with our all. We love ourselves more than God. We love other things more than God. Now, what is the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so for people who say, well, I'm not a sinner because I'm not a criminal. I I don't rape women. I, I pay my taxes. I provide for the needs of my family. I get offended by that statement that I am a sinner. But then again, what is the greatest commandment? to love the Lord your God with your all, then the greatest sin would be not to love the Lord your God with your all. And so even in this area, we clearly have sinned against God. But praise be to God when He saves us, when He grants us spiritual life, enabling us to respond to the gospel favorably. He gives us a new nature. The old is gone, the new has come. We are now new creatures in Christ, right? And we now have spiritual taste buds. 
that are able to taste and see the goodness of God, we now have this desire to know God as He is revealed in His Word. We now have this desire to serve the Lord, to make Him known, to declare and demonstrate the gospel. That's what happens when a person is justified by faith alone. His love for God is exhibited in the way he obeys the commandments of God. So to love Jesus, a person must first enter into a relationship with him. And the gateway to that is faith. Not your effort, but faith in him alone. No wonder the apostle John states, we love because... He first loved us. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? God did not wait, okay, straighten up, and then I'll die for you. No, while you were God's enemy, Jesus died for you. And the reason why we love him with our all is because we understand that he first loved us. He first pursued us. Hence, sola fide, or faith alone, provides the motivation for obedience. We see this clearly in the book of Romans. From chapters 3 to, chapters, to chapter 5, the apostle Paul unpacked the doctrine of justification by faith in ways that magnified God's grace. And by the way, the book of Romans, the book of Galatians and Ephesians are found in the Roman Catholic Bible. If only they just open the scriptures and and read it for themselves, they will realize that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The Apostle Paul unpacked this marvelous doctrine in the first half of, of his epistle in the book of Romans. And in the second half, as he transitions, he says, I appeal to you, therefore. That means he's making a conclusion. And its conclusion is based on justification by faith alone. Brothers, by the mercies of God, present your what? Your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, in light, Paul is saying, in light of what Christ did for us, in light of our justification, this is how you ought to live your life. Present your body. As a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God. And so the reformers did not miss this important connection. The gospel believed leads to the gospel applied. This is a much needed corrective, especially among Christians who are leaning towards antinomianism. In a time where Christian morals are being swallowed up by worldly values, the church today needs to reclaim the reformers' understanding of sola fide. We are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. So now that we've seen the clarifications made by the reformers on sola fide, how does sola fide apply to us today? For the Apostle Paul, justification by faith alone was not only a past event, it was also a present reality. At the time you trusted in Jesus, you were at that precise moment declared what? Righteous by God. You were justified, past tense. That's what Paul says in Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we now have what? Peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, I want you to see this. In Galatians 2.20, he speaks of it in the present tense. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So justification is a point in time event that happened in our past, but our justification is also a present reality. And I think this is where many Christians miss it. They can look back to the day that they trusted in Christ and say, yes, at that precise moment, I was justified by God. I was declared righteous by God. But sadly, today, they seek to live their lives as if 
It depends upon them. In their mind, they have reverted to a performance relationship with God. And so the thinking is this. If I had my quiet time, if I wake up at 6 in the morning and I had my quiet time for one hour, and I go about my day and I was able to share the gospel to my, to my colleague at work, and I was able to serve at church, if you slip into a performance-based relationship with God, you can actually feel good about yourself. When you're able to have a regular quiet time and can consistently serve the Lord in the church, And that's dangerous because you are now, and this is very subtle, right? Basing God's approval of you on your performance as a Christian. Now, what happens if the same person who was consistently, diligently spending time with the Lord in word and prayer, the next day sins big time? He fails the Lord. And of course, he's grieved over his sin. And he's now thinking, God will no longer show me favor. I am no longer accepted by God. And sadly, some Christians, they, they, they leave the church. They don't attend the worship service because they feel unworthy. Right? And they tell, you know, their Bible study group leader, I'm not going to attend anymore because I, I failed the Lord. I, I do not deserve to be part of the church anymore. Again, as Christians, we can have that kind of mentality, right? If we do not preach the gospel to ourselves daily. And this is some misconception that Christians have today. The gospel is only for unbelievers. When they think about the gospel, oh, that's... That's for our evangelism. That's for us to share the, gos- the, the, share the gospel to our unbelieving friends. But you need to understand the gospel is also for Christians. Amen? Because as Christians, we can still fail God. Amen? We can still sin against God. And so when those moments come, you need to remind yourself that you have been justified by God. You are declared righteous So even as a practicing sinner, that righteousness that God has granted you by faith is still with you, credited, imputed upon you. It will never be taken away from you. The gospel reminds us that our sins are forgiven and that we are clothed. In the righteousness of God. And so we need to appropriate, we need to apply the gospel every day to our lives. Jerry Bridges beautifully said, Now we want to be faithful, we want to work hard, but not in order to earn God's approval, but because we have God's approval. Amen. So sola fide indeed provides the motivation for godliness. Moreover, as we appropriate the gospel, it gives us the confidence to come into the very presence of God and to have communion with Him. In Ephesians 2.18, For through Him we, both Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. We cannot come directly to God. We must always come through the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen? And notice this, God not only allows us to come, but He invites us to come. And so even when you fail God as a believer, in Christ, you are still accepted by God. And He still invites you to come to Him. He still still longs to be in fellowship with you. So as you confess that sin to the Lord, As you repent of that sin, God will show you grace once again. And you see, the doctrine of sola fide shows us that God is not only able to save a sinner, but He is also able to restore a sinner to faithful service. Remember Peter? He denied Christ three times. 
felt so bad about what he did, and yet, who was the first disciple that Christ appeared to after he rose from the grave? Peter. Who was the disciple that God used to preach the gospel during the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people got saved? Peter. And so if the adversary of your soul is accusing you before God day and night, preach the gospel to yourself. Remind yourself that you are justified by faith alone. And remember this truth in Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you what? Has set you free from the law of sin and death. Indeed, in Christ, there is salvation. In Christ, there is freedom. Amen? Let's pray.